What about polar bears? Great place to talk about polar bears, Canada. In the 1960s, there were six to 10,000 polar bears. Snowmobiles and high-powered rifles were the main reason for that. Uh, snowmobiles are much more effective than snowshoes, and high-powered rifles are much more effective than spears. And so the population of polar bears did decline rapidly, but two uh, protection acts were enacted, 72 and 74, that established quotas. Today, there are 24,200 polar bears, and in fact, your country allows 800 legal kills per year to keep the population increased. I mean, that came from a scientific study. How many polar bears should we kill to keep the uh, uh, numbers at a reasonable uh, amount? So if you're talking about science and all science is numbers, polar bears are not threatened. Now, my country put them on the threatened species list a couple of years ago, even though the science, or I should say the numbers, did not support that. What about... You already know the answer to this one, but sea level will rise rapidly as Greenland melts. Well, here is sea level from uh, uh, satellites showing that since 1993, it has risen. It has not accelerated. And that's about as straight a line as you can get. Sea level always rises or falls. It's never just completely static. And so you would expect about an inch per decade, uh, 2.5 centimeters per decade, to uh, continue on. There is still ice to melt in this warm period we're in. And Greenland was much warmer in the past and it did not melt. The scary scenarios on sea level rise require Greenland to melt. In fact, Jim Hansen has testified that he thinks it could melt dramatically in the next 100 years. Well, it's a big chunk of ice that just can't melt that fast. Okay, what about dangerous weather? It's more frequent and more intense in unprecedented ways. We'll count the events. We can count tornadoes. They're not increasing in intensity or severity. We can count hurricanes. In fact, if you see the northern hemisphere amount, which is the lower curve here of, of total hurricane intensity, uh, it's about as low its level as it's been uh, uh, measured in the past 30 years or so. Uh, droughts, this is 1,200 years in the west, southwest U.S. Droughts come and droughts go. There have been some really bad droughts in the past, but that's normal. That's what happens in the southwestern United States. Uh, I used to have a big section on this. I just have one slide on uh, um, the health dangers that people promote about global warming. This one's on dinghy fever. I want you to notice that in Texas, in 1922, there were over 500,000 cases of dinghy fever. For the period 1980 to 1999, 20 years, Texas had 64. Why? We figured it out we figured out how to deal with this disease. Who hasn't figured it out, go right across the border to the three states of Mexico. In those same 20 years, they had over 62,000 cases. So here's a case. Climate had nothing to do with what's going on here. It has everything to do with your public health infrastructure and really the wealth you build in your economy. So what I've shown so far is that the global surface temperature is rising, but it's in a way that's inconsistent with what model, models show and greenhouse warming. Uh, overall, the ice mass decline, it's about an inch per decade. So, you know, be prepared for an inch per decade. That's the usual. Uh, severe weather is not, repeat, not becoming more frequent. Uh, diseases are first a function of public health infrastructure and not the climate. But this is the part of the talk that when I'm testifying before Congress and so on, uh, tends to ring a, a bell with some of the folks there. Please don't demonize energy. Without, <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, please don't demonize energy. I just occurred to me I'm in Alberta. <laughs> um, without energy, life is brutal and short. As mentioned, I lived in Africa. I taught um, physics and chemistry. And there's some of my students in the upper left. Uh, Peter Moriyuki in the upper right was our uh, temperature gatherer. Most people go to Africa to see the reticulated giraffe or hippos, uh, lions, tigers, uh, lions and elephants and so on. I went to uh, teach uh, physics and chemistry to uh, students that were just a terrific time, wonderful period of time. But I learned something about the energy system in Africa. The energy source is wood. It's, it's the side, forest in the sides of hills. The energy transmission system is the back of women. UN estimates a woman will get up and walk 3.1 miles in the morning, and I saw this every morning, 
chop down enough wood at the edge of the forest, put it on her back, about 40, 50 pounds, walk 3.1 miles back. And the real tragedy is the energy use. So you can, I hope you can see the uh, smoke uh, there in the hut. I was in many of these homes. Uh, the UN estimates between um, 1.8 and 5.2 million children die each year from this smoke inhalation, from respiratory diseases and so on that come from this energy system. And I can assure you of this fact, that African parents love their children. They love their children dearly, and when a child dies, they grieve inconsolably, just as you and I would. Now, I say that not to tug at your heartstrings, but to say this. They're not going to stand for that kind of energy system very much longer. They want electrification. They want mobility. They want the things that make life longer and better, not shorter and, and uh, more brutal. I remember talking to a student one time after he came back from, they, they have a, a semester, then a three weeks off, semester, three weeks off. It's a boarding school. A student came back. I had given assignments to all the class. None of the students had done their assignments. And I said, why didn't you do this, you know, uh, work on homework? He said, well, we had to work on the shamba, on the farm all day, or carry water for the girls and so on like that, so they didn't have time. And I said, well, why didn't you work at night? And one of the boys, you know, gave me that look of incredulity, like, you don't know anything, Mr. Christie. He says, our mother would never let us burn wood just for light. Why? She carried that wood on her back, and you're going to get every jewel of energy out of that wood you can muster, and to burn it just for light so your son can do homework was just not a good use of that energy. Well, they don't want that lifestyle. Energy demand is going to rise. Carbon energy is the cheapest form of energy. It is going to continue to rise, and we are not going to stop it, no matter how many laws we pass or government meetings we have or UN meetings there, there are. Energy demand, carbon energy demand, will continue to rise. So here's the dilemma. And there may be many of you here who think global warming is a serious problem, and, and, and you really believe it is something about which we need to... Uh, really get involved. And so, how can you meet, here's the dilemma, how can you meet significant energy growth and reduce CO2 emissions and thus manage the climate? Well, here's a secret, you can't manage the climate. Okay, it's just something that's out there that you're not going to manage, but, but let's give that hope. What did California do? Well, they forced a limit on light duty vehicles that now the EPA of our country has decided to uh, basically promote and established for the entire country. California AB 1493 said all cars must have, and light trucks, must have an average uh, fuel efficiency gain of 26% by 2016, or at that time it was 43 miles per gallon, way above what it is now. Now, manufacturers can make a 43 mile per gallon car, no problem, but this is the average, the fleet average that you sell in California has to have that. So whenever you sell that, uh, you know, 18 mile per gallon SUV, you have to sell a 65 mile per hour little, you know, go-kart or something. That was the problem. You cannot sell a mix of cars anywhere in the United States that averages 43 miles per gallon. So the automobile manufacturers sued. Uh, 11 northeastern states adopted this. And a trial was held in uh, Burlington, Vermont, about the engineering, legal, and climate issues in uh, 2007. I appeared as an expert witness on the side of the Alliance for Automobile Manufacturers uh, because they asked me an interesting question about climate and the effect of this bill, and I thought I could answer it, and I did. Uh, but I didn't take any money for it. Now, my wife, uh, you know, is just beside herself when she finds out how much uh, uh, lawyers, big-time lawyers will pay for expert witnesses. But um, it was an interesting scientific problem to me, and I was able to solve it. And though I testified a number of things about Greenland and so on. This is the guts. These are the guts of my testimony. I said, let's assume the IPCC is correct. Let's assume that is going to be the global temperature curve for the next hundred years. Let us apply California AB 1493 to the entire country. And not only that, but let's assume it's actually adhered to, which is rare for these kinds of laws. Let's assume they're actually ad adhered to. I gave every benefit I could to the law in this case. 